All right. Hello and good afternoon, everyone. We will go ahead and get started. Welcome to the webinar, Community Engagement Beyond the Buzz. My name is Courtney Brown, and I'm the Southeast Regional Coordinator from the Indiana State Library's Professional Development Office. I'll be the host and question moderator today. Our presenters this afternoon are Jean Canosa Albano, Assistant Director for Public Services at the Springfield City Library in Springfield, Massachusetts. Erica Frudenberger, Outreach and Engagement Consultant at the Southern Adirondack Library System in Saratoga Springs, New York. And Eileen Lupert, Managing Librarian of one of the largest branches of the Spokane County Library District in Spokane, Washington. I'd like to start off the webinar with a few announcements. To register for other webinars or other trainings available from the Professional Development Office, please see the Indiana State Library's events calendar, which can be found on our website at www.in.gov library. For a full list of our current in-person training menu, please see our continuing education website. If you have a question, just type it in the chat box on the upper left side of the screen. I'll be watching and I'll get the question to our presenters as soon as there's a good opportunity. There should also be some time near the end for questions as well. The session is about an hour, so you'll get one LEU for today. After the presentation has ended, please stay logged in to download your LEU. I'll also be posting a link to a survey about the presentation. Please fill out that survey. Let us know how we're doing. So again, please stay logged in at the end of the presentation for access to your LEU and survey link. If you're watching an archived recording of this webinar, instructions on how to obtain your LEU are in the video's description on YouTube. If at any point during the webinar you experience any sound issues, please see the sound issues box just below the chat box on the left side of the screen. If there's a global sound issue, we will announce it in the chat box. If you're unable to resolve the sound issues you're experiencing, we are recording the meeting and you can watch it online after the meeting has ended. So again, if there are any global sound issues, we will make an announcement in the chat box there on the left-hand side of the screen. So now I'm gonna turn the presentation over to Jean, Erica, and Eileen. So thanks so much, Courtney, for having us here today and for allowing us to talk about what we're all really passionate about, which is community engagement. I'm Erica Freudenberger. As Courtney said, I'm from the Southern Adirondack Library System in the Southern Adirondacks of New York State. And I'm going to start by talking off, uh, talking about why we do these things, because as Simon Sinek reminds us, it's important to start with why. And when it comes to community engagement, I have many reasons why I do this work. But mostly it's because I believe that in our complex and disruptive environment, public libraries can strengthen the social fabric in a, di in a digital age and create connections, collaborations, and help communities build the world, or at least their corner of it, as they would like it to be. We can empower the communities we serve by helping them identify and multiply resources through strategic collaborations develop inclusive plans that encourage citizens to become active agents in our democracy, and adapt local sustainable strategies to innovate and thrive so that libraries can as well. But in the end, when I'm being pragmatic, it's all about the Benjamins. If we want to create sustainable and resilient libraries that have the funding they need, community engagement is the work we need to do. So I'm going to share a little bit about my background. This is my third or fourth career. I came to libraries at the tail end of my 30s. And before that, I spent a number of years as an independent bookseller, a social justice activist, and a journalist. So what's the common thread? I've spent my life providing people with information to make informed choices about their lives. And isn't that what democracy is all about? I also have a profound love of story, because stories are what make us human, and I believe that every person and community has a great story to tell. In each of my professions, I've had a chance to hear stories and sometimes create them. I believe that as librarians, we're not in the book business, but the story business. It's our job to help people tell a story that changes the world. I am delighted to be the outreach and engagement consultant for the Southern Adirondack Library System. Um, I work with 34 member libraries in four counties. 
and I serve both small rural libraries and larger libraries with substantial budgets and professional staffs of 100 or more FTEs. The work that we're talking about today is scalable to all of them. So it could be the Racket Lake Library that I work with that serves a community of 114 to a community that serves you know, 50 or 60,000. Before I came to South, I was the director of the Red Hook Public Library, which is located in the Hudson Valley of New York. And some of the work that I'm gonna talk about today took place when I was at the Red Hook Public Library. So back in 2014, the Red Hook Public Library was one of 10 libraries chosen to take part in the American Library Association's Libraries Transforming Communities Initiative, which is where I met Eileen and Jean and the fab uh, fabulous Emily Bunyan from Knox County Public Libraries, and I imagine a number of you know her. I want to take a moment here to pause and encourage other small libraries to shoot for the stars and go for big opportunities when they arise. The Red Hook Public Library was the smallest library chosen to participate. We serve a population of 1,961 people, and I was the first full-time employee the library ever had. We had to create teams of five to participate in the cohort, which meant I had to find volunteers from the public to take part, or I would have had to close the library because we didn't have that much staff. I wanna challenge other small libraries to try big things. We have a lot to bring to the table and deserve to be there. So anyway, back to my story. At the first meeting, my team were feeling quite smug. We were already collaborating with everyone in town, and our team included our deputy mayor, the director of Bard College's Center for Civic Engagement, and a retired regional head of state parks. And um, we were very smug, we thought we were winning, and we were completely wrong. And that's because collaboration and partnership are not community engagement. Working across institutional boundaries is incredibly important, but until we make time to have conversations with our communities about their aspirations, and then empower them to make the changes they wanna see, we're really only scratching the surface. Previously, when we were collaborating with community groups, we were asking for what the library needed and then giving them what we thought they needed. In retrospect, I see how arrogant it was to assume that we knew what the community wanted. And we weren't asking our community what vision it had for ourselves. So we were talking a lot, but we were totally having the wrong conversation. I wanna talk for a moment about the difference between outreach and engagement, because community engagement does have a bit of buzz to it now. There's been some rebranding of former outreach positions to engagement positions, but we need to be clear. Outreach and engagement are two very different strategies and processes. Outreach lets other people know all about the fabulous work being done by the library. It's a great way to push our message out to the public, and it's really important and we absolutely need to continue to do that work, but it's not community engagement. Community engagement is about empowering people to make the changes they wanna see in the world and helping people live their best lives. Libraries are part of larger socio-ecosystems and we can only thrive when our communities do as well. We can do that by developing relationships and offering people the opportunity to play meaningful roles in our organizations and build our capacity by involving the public in our decision-making. When we take an engaged approach to decision-making, we align our priorities and services with community aspirations so that we can move forward together. This approach acknowledges the future of libraries, which is relational, not transactional. And I don't wanna say that we're not gonna to continue to share materials. We always will. Transactions will always be a part of what we do will always host programs and provide services, but all of that has to be deeply grounded in the relationships we have developed and nurtured and be a reflection of the communities we serve. And from, as you can see from the quote here, as David Lankis says, bad libraries build collections, good libraries build services, great libraries build communities, and let's be great. So how do we do that? By shifting our conversation and our thinking from expert knowledge, which is what we know as professionals about libraries, how they're run and what we're capable of, to public knowledge, the stuff everyone else is talking about and what matters to them 
in their lives and in the community. As librarians, we have lots of expert knowledge. We're really great at collecting, sorting, and distributing information, but we're not always great at knowing what people really want, and we spend a lot of time giving them what we think they want, or worse yet, what we think they should want. Has anyone ever given a program and had no one come? Or perhaps I am alone in that. So instead of doing that, we need to convene and facilitate conversations about what we value as a community and how we'll create what we want to see happen. So in Red Hook, when we talked to our community, one of the issues that came up was safety, which completely perplexed me. People who live in the village didn't lock their doors or their cars, so what did they mean when they were talking about safety? When we drilled down, we found out they were talking about the traffic light. So this is, and I know it sounds like I'm bragging, this is, we have one traffic light in town, and this is it. Um, about 20 years ago, the timing loop on the light broke and led to what the um, president of Bard College termed uh, perverse backups. The mayor at the time had had a falling out with the guy at the Department of Transportation, and so 20 years later, when the mayor, when the current mayor, who was not the same as was back 20 years ago, um, but the dude at the DOT was still the same, and he was still mad about whatever happened um, all those years ago, he refused to fix the timing loop. So due to the broken timing loop, traffic backs up, and people have unreasonably long delays. This is the intersection of two major county routes with semis and other trucks passing through regularly. In order to avoid the traffic light, people cut through the side streets, which do not have sidewalks. As people were speeding through, kids and seniors were put at risk, and some got hit by cars. It was like an incredibly weird game of Frogger. So when people in Red Hook talk about safety, what they meant was a traffic light needed to be fixed. We let the mayor know, and he called the guy at the DOT who did nothing. And after a couple of weeks went by, we asked the mayor if we could get in touch with the people who said that this was an issue for them and have them take action, and he did. He gave us the contact information for the guy at the DOT. And we uh, posted the information on Facebook. Somebody had taken the time to start a Facebook group called We Hate the Red Hook Traffic Light. We posted there, say, hey, if you hate it, here's who to call. And um, then the magic happened. The same man who wouldn't fix the light when the mayor asked began getting calls from concerned citizens. As dozens of calls came in, a crew was dispatched to Red Hook to fix the timing loop. And just like that, it was fixed. I share this story to demonstrate not that the library got this done, but that we provided the necessary information to the community so that they could make the change they wanted and be the hero of their own story. It really changed the way people began to think about things. We're no longer waiting for someone else to solve our problems. We can take action to create the community we want to see, and that's powerful stuff. And I want to be really clear, it isn't our job as a library to address every challenge identified by our community, but it is to alert people to what issues are out there and to bring people together to find solutions. So we often like to say that public libraries are the cornerstone of democracy, but what does that mean? For me, it means that we're not here to create the best possible consumers we can. We're here to empower and educate engaged citizens ready to take action on the matters that mean the most to them. It's important and energizing work, and we're in a unique position to do it. Community engagement shifts the focus to joint decision-making and empowerment. It allows people to ha have a say about decisions that affect their lives. And I'm going to be honest, it takes a lot of time and chances are a significant organizational shift to do this work. It's really hard to let go of the library being the center of the universe, but it is the work that we're here to do of empowering citizens to be actively involved in a democratic society. It's also a lot of work, and it can be terrifying, exhilarating, and sometimes a hot mess, and that's okay. You need to be able to build capacity and put yourself in a vulnerable position where you may not have all the answers. But give yourself a break and trust that others will be there to catch you when you fall. 
Two years ago, when the town of Red Hook wrote a new planning law to limit drive-through and formula businesses, they cited the work the library had done in identifying community priorities as the basis of their decision. This blew me away. The work we had done will influence what our town looks like for years to come, which is amazing. The mayor of Red Hook called the shift in our town the Red Hook Renaissance and said the library had been a big part of it, which made me proud. But what we did was really nothing special, and it's based on a very simple premise. Find out what really matters to people and make it happen. Why? Because I want our library and all libraries to go viral, to become so deeply embedded in the communities we serve that we're a part of every conversation and sit at every table. What I've talked about today may sound idealistic, but if we want to create sustainable and resilient libraries that have the funding they need, community engagement is work we need to do. In my six years as director, I more than doubled the budget of my library, increasing the margin of success each time. How? By creating space for people's voices to be heard, by including them in a conversation about our community, and helping them take the action they needed to make the changes they desired. As Emily Bunyan of Knox County Public Library says, community engagement requires shifting our thinking from the library being the heart of the community to the community being the heart of the library. And now I'm going to turn it over to the wonderful Eileen Lupert from Spokane County Library District. Thank you, Erica. I'm going to talk uh, a little bit more about strategies for getting out there and being involved in the community. But really quickly first, I'd like to put my library size into context as well. The Spokane County Library District is 11 libraries with 134 full-time employees. Our service area is 269,000 residents, and we work with 18 different school districts around our county. I'm in a location that's about 15 miles from the downtown city of Spokane, and our residents' uh, service area is about 100,000. Spokane County Library's participation, excuse me, Spokane County Library District's participation in the Harwood ALA cohort changed us forever, hopefully. Not long after we started in 2014, the job descriptions for librarians changed to include community engagement. We moved to a single service point model to free up li librarian time and to get us out of the building. Since then, we no longer have a strategic plan. We aptly renamed it the Community Engagement Plan. Our vision and mission changed too. Now our mission, providing resources, experiences, and places that empower people to learn, explore, and succeed, demonstrates our commitment to the community. It's not an accident that the mission leaves out the word library or books. It reflects that modern libraries are about connecting, sharing, and learning. And we know we cannot make this happen successfully without an authentic understanding of our community. Community engagement can be intimidating if you're new to it. Most of us are introverts by nature, but we find a way to turn on the energy and fake it to fake our way through introverting, excuse me, fake our way through extroverting when we must. For true engagement, we must to the best of our ability. If you have no clue where to start, the Harwood tools through ALA are a great place. The link is there on the screen. These tools are exercises and scripts to help you talk to your community members and to patrons. The purpose of these tools is to understand the community's aspirations. What do people want for themselves and for the future? They ask, what kind of community do you want to live in and what is stopping us from getting there? The tools take different amounts of time to complete. There is a quick ask exercise with four questions that just takes minutes. Our library has done these exercises at resource fairs or while tabling different events. And Erica uh, in Red Hook took her whole staff door to door with the ask exercises in hand. There's also a script to hold community conversations with small groups of people for a much deeper understanding of what matters to them. Usually those group sizes are eight to 12 people and we found about an hour to be a good amount of time and a reasonable ask of groups. There's about 10 questions that you use to facilitate the conversation. Once you've completed enough conversations and exercises, there are additional tools to help you distill the contents to find commonalities and themes among them. The aspirations become the library's north star for planning and evaluating library programs and services. The overall goal is to find the things that matter to your community, figure out where the library best fits in to do it, and then do it, and keep doing it. Learn, act, evaluate, repeat. I understand that there's been some changes to these tools since our cohort was involved with them, but the gist is the same. I will mention that we made some adjustments to the process the second time that we did this. We were a bit more select in some of the groups that we sought out for conversations. 
Erica talked about expert and public knowledge. And I think the first time we did this, we took expert knowledge to mean not talking to some of the, um, the people who are experts in their field. Both are important, but for the first time we did it, those expert opinions uh, were missing in some cases. And by that, I don't mean statistic statisticians or what we knew anecdotally. Um, the second time we went out of our way to talk to people who were on the front lines of nonprofits or the folks that were per personally impacted by some of the decisions that we might make. For example, we had seniors the first time around that said teens needed more things to do, which might suggest the library plan more teen programs. But when we spoke to parents of those teens, we heard that there was too much to do because of homework and appointments and because parents worked full time. This suggests that the library should reach the teens where they are in school or look for ways to help the parents help their kids. This time around, we talked to many people, um, or excuse me, this time around, many people talked to us about the rise of homelessness in our area. But we got a different perspective when we talked to individuals who work for agencies with clients who are homeless, or when we spoke to school counselors who work with homeless students. That helped us understand that homelessness can look very different from one demographic to another. While the intentionality of Harwood's cycle is important, I think true engagement has to include cultivating relationships with both individual community members and local agencies. It shouldn't be a stage in a cycle, but should be ongoing. That means getting out there and networking without the tools. The good news is that if you have used the tools, you should have some leads and some contacts to know where to begin. Engagement is like networking at times, and networking, unfortunately, is kind of like dating. They can both be awful and awkward and stressful, but we have to suck it up and do it if we're ever going to find meaningful partnerships. Fake it till you make it, even if you have to fake it forever. It pays to strategize and have a plan ahead of time. Whether you are networking at a fundraising event, tabling a resource fair, or meeting a potential partnership in a conversation, pre prepare and be proactive. Know why you are a catch. Before you leave the library, think about what you have to offer. Have an elevator speech. Figure out if there's overlap between your library's mission and the agency's mission that you're trying to reach out to. Do they meet upstream somewhere? Have talking points about the library's current programs and services. Have a question or two to ask other people. And think through how you might respond to similar questions. Not only will you seem brilliant when you talk to people, but you'll be building your confidence. Ask yourself, are they relationship material? And know how to demonstrate that you are. Once you're out in the public, especially in the beginning, listen more than talk. Learn and observe. Who are the talkers and who gets the work done? As you get more involved, don't offer what you cannot deliver and always follow through with what you'll say you do. Do not show up, tell, them, tell the group why they should come to the library and disappear. That is an engagement, it's a presentation. So be reliable and dependable. Be patient and see where things can lead. Don't hold out too long for the perfect person or agency when they aren't interested or able to work with you, but don't give up too quickly either. We often say at SCLD that we need to run with the willing because you never know where it will run to and sometimes it leads you back to where you hope to go in the beginning. A quick story about the Greater Valley Support Network. GVSN is a coalition filled with nonprofits and educators. And prior to going, prior to, going to any meetings, I was struggling to connect to my local school district and I knew some of the educators were attending these meetings. At first I showed up and the meetings were chaotic and I was frustrated that I still couldn't connect to the educators and frankly I didn't know what they were doing at times, but I kept going. I'd listen, I'd tell them about library related things when appropriate, and I offered to help occasionally. Over time I became an active member in the group and made connections with the school district's social worker and their homeless liaison. Those contacts have turned into reliable partnerships with schools across the whole district. So where to go? Got to put yourself out there. Once you've developed some confidence, try going to local events, celebrations, school boards, PTA groups, back to school nights, coalition meetings, chambers of, event, chambers of commerce events. There are lots of clubs as well. Lions clubs, Kiwanis, Rotary, town grages, and neighborhood associations. Go to any place where the community gathers, talks, and will let you in. Remind yourself that people love librarians and will most likely be happy that you're there, even if they don't understand why you're there. This slide has several examples. Librarians networking with each other at a state conference is a great place to start. Everybody's feeling awkward. Or festivals, such as Valley Fest on the left. But don't just sit there and hand out flyers to people who are brave enough to make eye contact with you. Say hello to everyone, stay standing if you can, and bring an activity or a craft. 
This gives you the opportunity to talk to the adult about library resources or programs while their kid finger paints or plays. Or ask the kid while they're playing what sort of things do they like. Do they like Legos? And then you turn to the adult and hand them a flyer on Lego Club. One of our librarians was even brave enough to step outside of her comfort zone and join the Chamber of Commerce as an ambassador. Or she accepted it when she was voluntold to do so. They got rid of those ugly green jackets, but it remains a great way for the library to meet local, local business owners. Of course, be mindful of your capacity. While seeking good partners and even while working with them, it's important to remember your library's capacity and also mission creep. There are lots of ways to partner and network regardless of your budget or staff time. Like the Greater Valley Support Network that I mentioned, the Homeless Coalition is made up of nonprofits, government agencies, churches, schools, and more. We meet monthly to share news and legislative updates, to hear speakers, to learn from each other, and to encourage one another. I joined a committee from this coalition that started the annual Homeless Connect eight years ago. It's a huge resource fair built around the idea that a person experiencing homelessness should be able to come for an afternoon and accomplish as much as they might in several weeks' time. Services include things like signing up for food or state assistance, applying for housing vouchers or health insurance, you can get a warrant quashed, a haircut, and a hot meal. There's a food bank and a clothing bank to shop in, and you can take your pet to the vet for vaccinations. There are medical checks and dental checks and job placement help. And now the library participates. We forgive large library fines, and we offer our limited use cards to people without verifiable addresses. After volunteering for the City Connect, I was repeatedly asked back in the valley where my library is, 15 miles away, why the event wasn't coming out there. Deciding it wouldn't come if we all waited for it, I brought it here myself. I pulled together a committee from the Greater Valley Support Network membership, and we held our first successful Valley Connect event last September. We had 12 paying sponsors, 50 vendors, 20 volunteers, and we served 325 people that afternoon. The success of this event was in no small part due to the contacts that I had made at the coalition and the Connect Planning Committee. Finding these coalitions and participating in these resource fairs are extraordinarily fruitful, so I encourage you to find one if you can, or start one if you can't. These groups become like vast personal reference collections of your community. When you don't have the staffing, time, or resources for monthly coalition meetings, there are smaller things that you can do to be a good partner and be out in the community. Like lots of libraries, we have an annual summer concert. However, ours at Spokane Valley was seeing pathetic attendance numbers because the concerts were in our ugly, windowless basement, and who wants to be there in the summer? At a Homeless Coalition meeting, I learned about two agencies that could help solve our problem. Naomi is a local transitioning housing project for homeless mothers and their children that are about, and the location is about one mile away from the library. It's two small houses that are side by side, and you'd never know from the front that, that the houses share a large backyard with a play structure, a garden, a chicken coop, and a stage that was built by an Eagle Scout. When I toured their backyard space, it reminded me of a park, and parks are a great place for concerts. I also learned about Christ Kitchen. It's a job training program providing support to women living in poverty by teaching them how to cook and cater. They happen to have a food truck. So this July, we will hold our third annual summer concert at Naomi. Christ Kitchen brings their food truck to make the concert an outdoor picnic, too. The library sponsors the music and the food truck, Naomi hosts and provides a lovely space for the concert. We all support women learning new skills and reach audiences that we may not have reached on our own. The work that the library puts in is hardly more than what we would normally do for a concert, but the result and the impact are ex exponentially more than if we, the concert took place in our basement with no partners. Going to where the people are is always good advice for librarians, but stay focused on it and take some time to rethink it occasionally. What services are you already doing that you can take somewhere new? Open Doors is a shelter for families experiencing homelessness. After learning about it, we reached out to them, and now we do a monthly story time there. It has some challenges, and our staff went through some additional training to understand how to work with people experiencing trauma so that we could best serve this unique po population. But Cindy, pictured here, continues to say that the experience is the best, even when it is the worst, of her story time career. So think about it, are there other low-income or senior housing facilities that you could bring your services to? Instead of a tween program in the library with dwindling attendance numbers, can you offer a similar program at the YMCA or the Boys and Girls Club? Can you hold an after-school program in a school after school? Making these unique connections and partnerships reaches new audiences and leads to even more connections. Don't forget your staff. 
If you cannot leave your building, you can still network from the library. Being behind the desk keeps you in touch with your customers, and of course, they're a part of the community too. But don't forget the staff. Use your colleagues. Find out what they're involved in, do they live in the area, and what connections they might be willing to share. Does their spouse work for a school? Do they have a parent who's a small business owner? That sort of thing. But do so in a non-stalking way that HR would approve of. The best strategy to understand and practice effective community engagement is just to keep doing it and see what works for you in your library. You learn as you go, and then you repeat and do it better next time. Every failure is a lesson learned, so don't be afraid to try new things. With that, I'll say thanks for listening to me, and I'm going to turn it over to Jean to talk about making this all stick. Good afternoon. I'm Jean Canosa Baino from Springfield City Library in Massachusetts. There we go. There's a view of my beautiful city, and it is in beautiful Western Massachusetts, and it's the center of city life and culture where we embrace our diversity and celebrate learning, creativity, and innovation. It's a hub for free access to information and technology, social and civic engagement, and support of personal enrichment, well-being, and lifelong learning. We actively connect with our diverse community and provide effective resources and a safe place for all. I am the assistant director here, and I've worked here for many a year, over 30 years. So, to put in context, our population is about 154,000 people, and Springfield is a city on the rise. We're really proud to be part of this urban renaissance. Each year, the library welcomes over 600,000 visitors throughout our nine locations. And in 2018, we offered 5,308 programs for adults, teens, and children. Our 75,000 plus registered patrons account for circulation of nearly 650,000 people, uh, items, excuse me. But of course, it's the people behind those numbers that tell the true story. And it's those people who need to be turned outward. Uh, you've heard Erica and Eileen talk about a number of the terms that the Harwood Institute uses and I've really latched on to the turn outward one. That means that's a way of making all of your decisions from what programs to offer to what your policies should be like to adapt them based on what we know about our community by listening and being in it. Uh, it's that expert knowledge versus public knowledge that Erica talked about. So when you are turned outward, you're making decisions based on what you know about the community, not just sitting around a boardroom and looking up census numbers. Not long after we completed the library's Transforming Communities training, we received a gift from a local marketing firm celebrating a significant anniversary. They selected Springfield City Library to receive a rebranding package, including a new logo, tagline, and style guide. The result is all yours, just ask. And now that the Harwood Institute training and the initial practice were complete, we worked work through all of those tools that um, Eileen and Erica talked about the community conversation, the ask exercises, and so forth. Now that that was done and the new brand was in place, the really hard work began. Making it stick. So the new tagline was a challenge and a daily reminder to us to be turned outward, that it's not our library, it's the community's library. So how do we make it stick? First, we need to have turned outward people working for us. 
Ideally, your staff is already made up of folks who enjoy engaging with the community, being a part of it, and taking direction for all those decisions made based on what they're hearing from folks in the community. However, that's not always the case. Options include attending training, working through the tools that are available on the website that Eileen highlighted for you, uh, offering coaching sessions, and assigning people without this orientation where they will have less act, impact on the engagement work of the library. Ideally, folks without this orientation will come along with training and coaching, but others may see that this is no longer the place for them. People do decide to move on or when they retire, they will leave you with a vacancy, aka an opportunity. When we have a vacancy, we pull out all the stops to recruit people with a turned outward attitude. Hope you can read that on the screen. We write it right into our recruitment materials. And we also focus on the city and the community including videos showing residents engaged in learning, working, and playing in our city. Tweets and other social media posts mention awards and accolades the library staff have won, all for work focusing on the community. Then once the applications come in, I use screening interviews to determine who to offer the full interviews to, and I always ask the question, why Springfield? Candidates' answers reveal a lot about their potential fit with our style of work and their curiosity and commitment to community. When we meet with job candidates, we ask them traditional questions and we also ask them that are less so. Why do you want to begin or further your career here in Springfield? If you could do anything, anything at all, what would you do? What are the top aspirations of Springfield adults or teens? What are the challenges to achieving them? Who should the library partner with to achieve those aspirations. Candidates prepare a short presentation for us showcasing a program they would like to develop for their target audience at the library. When we evaluate the presentation, not only are we looking for how fully fleshed out it is, attention to budget, thoughtful marketing and the like, but also how in tune it is with our community. A recent candidate for our teen services librarian position knocked our socks off with a great presentation about a poetry slam she envisioned. It featured so many of the aspirations that we hear from teens in our community. Leadership development opportunities, using their own voices, bridging racial divides, social justice work through the arts, in her words, candidate's words, let's showcase the public library as a space where teen patrons can express themselves, showcase their talents, and connect with community members and organizations. Needless to say, she got the job, and I definitely consider her turned outward. Another way we make the turned outward orientation stick is by normalizing it, making it a part of all we do and talking about it a lot. Everyone's favorite part of the work week, staff meetings, are even more fun if we keep our focus on the community. Departments also submit monthly reports to our director's office. And one of the questions is, what are we hearing from the community? At first, some staff wasn't sure how to answer this question. 
We're not simply looking for comments on the library's schedule or collections. The report form now clarifies, even if it has nothing to do with the library. We want to know what our community members' aspirations and challenges are. Once at a staff meeting, a librarian happened to mention the difficulty patrons have expressed getting jobs due to their criminal background check status. This is the kind of thing we should be looking for and listening for. It lets us know that when a community group wants to hold a session on seeking employment post-incarceration, or if we have an opportunity to offer a program on closing a criminal record after paying your dues, that those are programs that will be of interest to members of our community. Right now, we are just right now we are currently undertaking the strategic planning process, and I love Eileen's idea of changing the name of it. I may just do that. Uh, nine of our staff members form the steering committee, and we are working with the brilliant Maureen Sullivan, former president of ALAA, who brought the library's transforming uh, cohort uh, and grant opportunity to ALA during her presidency. We've kept in mind the work we did during the implementation of the Harwood tools while working on the strategic plan, including the community narrative we wrote. And that's another term that we picked up from the Harwood folks. The purpose of the community narrative is to replace the same old story that keeps people ruminating on the past, wishing we could go back there, or believing that previous failures mean that change is impossible. The new narrative, based on themes that arose in the community conversations we held, is excerpted here. People want a safe, vibrant community with diverse leadership, multiple cultural institutions, lots of places for residents to gather, opportunities for young people to build leadership skills. And people are concerned about violence and fear, lack of understanding, limited opportunities for young people, and no safe places to gather. They also feel that positive things just aren't celebrated. So we really learned from all we heard in the conversations that we need to build leadership opportunities for young people. We tripled the number of teen advisory boards at our libraries. Folks in the community said they want reasons to be outside in the community so we helped plan, along with community members, ways to reclaim the outdoor space. They also asked us to focus on more intergenerational events. And they named an agency or an organization, Gardening the Community, that they would really trust to help move the community forward and uh, that they would be buy-in to the work if they were part of the activities. So I want to show you just a couple of things that we have done in response to those uh, key findings. The public safety response was to get involved in a uh, unique uh, program that goes on here in Springfield. Um, they call it C3, and in na different neighborhoods throughout the city, state police, local police, local residents, and different community organizations gather on a weekly basis. We host it at two of our different branches, and people are learning the truth about what's happening with crime, and that helps allay fears, and it also lets um, members of the community report things that they are seeing and hearing. Now, there's always people gathered around behind this store because the lights always burnt out, for example. 
Um, this is a very, very popular gathering, and we have gained so much knowledge from what we hear there, uh, trust of staff by community members, by being an active host and uh, participant in these meetings. And uh, they also have funded programs for us. We started having a annual end of summer uh, celebration and gathering on the front yard of our Mason Square Branch Library. And in this photo, you can see folks from the boards of elections. You can see people uh, eating. You can see uh, the local carnival association, Caribbean Carnival Association, uh, cooking up food for folks. Uh, we had a book sale, all kinds of different fun things happening there with music as well. You can see some of the garden boxes that we have going out in front there. Springfield is where basketball was mentioned, and I had to show this slide to my Indiana peeps. Um, this uh, little parklet that you see is right in front of that same Mason Square Branch Library. And it celebrates the birth of basketball. Uh, there, you can see the golden arches in the background. That's really where it started. But um, they didn't allow for a park to be built in their parking lot. So here we go, right in the front of the library. Uh, and that the taller statue signifies one of the men who played the first game. And the child is modeled on children of today in the neighborhood. And you will see the glass um, borders behind them. And they tell the story of the history of basketball. Uh, when this first was open, it was quickly boarded up. The glass parts of it were boarded up. And people in our community conversations were so upset about that and hurt that they were not trusted to not uh, damage them, vandalize them, and they would be unboarded for Basketball Hall of Fame enshrinement weekend and then boarded up again. So we took this public knowledge forward, um, just like Erica did about the light, and brought it to the powers that could do something about this, and so did other folks, uh, but they have no longer uh, been boarding them up anymore. And when Bill Walton recently came to the Hall of Fame, uh, he came and did a read aloud with some Head Start children at our library, and then they went and visited it. I'm sorry it's not Larry Bird, but um, there you go, Bill Walton. So the focus on what we've been hearing from the community grounds us and steers our work. For the strategic planning process and vision creation, our community surveys were fairly traditional, and I do have some regrets about that. Um, they resulted in very little that was illuminating, mostly affirmation of what we were already doing, requests for more books, programs, hours. With Maureen's guidance, we revised the first draft of the staff survey to focus less on job satisfaction and more on what staff perceive as service gaps and how we could be better engaged with the community. Although the plan is still being polished, we'll bring it to our library commissioners for preliminary approval next week. I'm thrilled with the turned out which outward approach we have adopted. Our draft goals are framed around the community. In the end, making turned outward stick depends on leadership. Ideally, library boards and administration are engaged and committed to this new way of working. But of course, we can all lead from where we are. Our community narrative informs us of what residents aspire to, and provides guidance as to partners we should be working with for added impact and credibility. This compass means our direction is clear and we can speak and act with authenticity. Leaders inspire folks in their spheres. No matter whether you're a leader at the top, you're leading from where you are. 
your frontline staff person. You have folks you can inspire in your sphere. I continue to be inspired by the words of Rich Harwood, founder of the Harwood Institute, who spoke on a recent podcast about the impact we can have, even when we may think our actions are small. He reminds us that our efforts ripple out in all directions, and we don't know what impact they will have. Our efforts will spark something in others and connect to other small actions. These small actions we take are signs of authentic hope, of civic faith, that we and others in our community matter. We are agents of hope. Let's get out there and inspire hope. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, ladies, for that great information. If you have any questions for Eileen, Erica, or Jean, please type those in the chat box right now um, on the left-hand side of your screen. Um, I don't see any typing, but if you think of anything, go ahead and type those in. Um, while we're doing questions, I am just going to move over to that LEU pod. Um, you can go ahead and download your LEU there at the top. You'll need to select Beyond the Buzz LEU and then click Download File. Also, that survey link is in the middle of the screen. Um, if you could take that survey, give us some feedback on, on the presentation. I will share that with the presenters as well. And then the contact information for our three presenters are there at the bottom. And if you scroll down a little bit, mine is there as well if you'd like to get a hold of me. Um, if you have any questions, again, please type them in the chat box. Did you ladies well, have I anything always, you wanted to add don't have questions, or finish up with? Um, I always like to ask people, what about what we talked about today resonated with you? And can you think of a single action with either a group, a person, or a stakeholder organization that you can take um, when you get back to your library to do some of this work? Great. We do have a question. Um, Francis says, we want to be engaged, ah, but how do we get the don't community, wait for the community to, reach out to, to reach out to you? You go out to the community where they are and start asking them questions. Don't wait for an invitation. I think um, that was my experience. I think it was Eileen's experience also. It's that um, too often we, we wait to be invited because we think that we're not welcome when really we're just not on people's radar. And if we show up and start getting involved, you will soon have um, more things to respond to than you can imagine. So just as my mother always told me when I was young, get your nose out of a book and go outside and play. And uh, as the great Congresswoman Shirley Chisholm said, bring your own chair. If you're not invited to the table, bring your own <laughs> chair. Yes. I mean, it's about paying attention to what's going on out there, seeing where, where who's doing something interesting or who's talking about a topic that's interesting that you want to learn more about, hear more about what's happening in the community, and learning how you can respond. And as Eileen mentioned earlier, um, in Red Hook, we actually went door to door in our community and just knocked on doors and said, can we ask you a couple questions? You know, what, do you, um, what are your aspirations for this community? What challenges are we facing? And, and how do we create the kind of community we want to live in? And if you start just asking people those kind of questions, you will get plenty of input. I think that's very true. People like to talk about themselves or, or what they want, so um, go into where they are and just asking them. It's, don't wait for them. I think that's the best advice. Frances says she likes those ideas. <laughs> If you have any more questions, feel free to type those in the chat box. I see some people typing, so we'll hang on here for a few minutes. Just a reminder to download your LEU. If you are watching an archived version of this recording, um, instructions on how to get your LEU are in the uh, video's description on YouTube. Um, we will hang out here for a few more minutes. 
Oh, here, Anita says, I really like the quote, the library should not be the heart of the community. The community well, needs to be the heart of the library. Well, that quote is from the most amazing it really gives me Emily Bunyan from the Knox County Public Libraries. And do you all know her? Because she's in Indiana, and she is fantastic. She was part of the Libraries Transforming Cohort. So if you're looking for um, somebody to be inspired by, look no further than Emily Bunyan. She's terrific. We all happened to be sitting in the room when Emily made that statement, and it, we all kind of went, oh, like it just summarized the yeah. entire 18 months of, what, of the work we were about to do, and it, and it still does. Yeah, goosebumps. She gives me goosebumps. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and we have attendees saying, yes, they know Emily. So I want to thank Eileen, Erica, and Jean for taking the time out to share their expertise with us. If you have any more questions, feel free to put those in the chat box. We'll hang on here maybe for two or three more minutes um, just in case any questions arise. Otherwise, please write down their contact information. If you think of something you know, later after the yes, presentation absolutely. has ended, feel free to get with As you can tell, we love to talk questions. about this stuff. So if you think of something or if you're trying something out and getting stuck, please reach out and, and we're happy to talk you through it. Absolutely. Absolutely. I second that.